Welcome to today's webinar, Screening, Diagnosis, and Challenges in Kids with Diabetes, Simple Things That Can Change and Save Lives. We're so glad you could join us. My name is Amy Gall, and I'm the Director of Education for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. The partnership is providing today's program. I'd like to share a few pieces of information before we get started. The speaker and planners have no relevant conflicts of interest for this program to disclose. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Please complete the survey to provide us with feedback on the program. To receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. Certificates of completion will be sent via email within one week of the webinar broadcast. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on the partnership's YouTube channel until November 18, 2022. Although we will be muting all attendees' microphones during the presentation, we would love to hear from you. So please write your questions in the question box and our speaker will respond to as many as possible at the conclusion of her lecture. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Alicia Downs' diverse nursing career has given her experience with a broad range of clients and a variety of health conditions in addition to diabetes. She has worked in child development, medical rehab, community-based nursing, as well as behavioral health. Since joining the team at Integrated Diabetes Services in 2017, she has worked educating patients as well as clinicians remotely across the country and around the world. Alicia is a proud graduate of the Cecile College School of Nursing and received both her bachelor's and master's of science in nursing from Western Governors University. She's an active member of the Pennsylvania Nurses Association and the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, both locally and nationally. Welcome, Alicia. Thanks so much, Amy. It's great to be here. It's great to uh, educate my fellow clinicians um, and, and people in the healthcare sphere um, about an area very near and dear to my heart, which is uh, type 1 diabetes and kids. Um, so let's jump in going to uh, turn off my camera so everybody can see the slides more fully. Uh, so we're looking at screening and diagnosis and challenges, particularly in kids with diabetes. Uh, this is a really important topic to me, like I said, because I am a person with diabetes um, and I'm also a mom. Um, I have, skip. Sorry, my slides are glitching there. What? Um, this is the the info that Amy mentioned earlier. But um, I have a so I have a lot of diabetes. I was actually adult diagnosed, um, and I've worked in community health. So I have worked a lot with families um, out there in the real world. Um, and as a mom, um, you know, I want the help best for my little guy, and I know every family really wants the best. Um, for their kids, but uh, diabetes is, makes it really difficult. Um, it's really hard on families and clinicians because it can be really hard to spot. Um, and then dealing with that early diagnosis is really tough, especially with kids. Diabetes is tough for me to manage from inside my own body at 39 years old with a degree in it, <laughs> um, but man managing it from outside of the body of a small person who may not be able to communicate how they're feeling um, is a whole other kind of difficult. So coming alongside these families is really important. So what is type one diabetes? Uh, type one diabetes is when our immune system or possibly um, another cause, but typically with kids, it's our immune system attacks insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas. Um, and insulin is a key that allows glucose to come from our bloodstream into our cells for energy. So without that key, our cells don't have enough energy. Our brains don't have enough energy. Um, we're also going to see then the side effect of that, which is elevated glucose in the bloodstream. 
um, this is then the marker that lets us know um, whether we have diabetes and um, how well it's being controlled. So type 1 diagnosis um, in children impacts about 78,000 children will be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes annually worldwide. Um, and there are about a million children living with diabetes worldwide today. Um, that's a big number, but it is still pretty a pretty rare diagnosis overall. It's about 1% of uh, the U.S. population and about 1% of the world population um, lives with type 1 diabetes. Um, one that is really striking to me is this, that 228 children ages 1 to 19 died in the U.S. of diabetes complications from 2012 to 2014. The predominant cause of death by far um, in children with diabetes is due to DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, and what's even more striking is that these rates are twice as high in African-American children than in Caucasian children. However, diagnosis rates are actually slightly lower in the African-American population than in the Caucasian population. So we can see that these children are definitely being under-recognized and under-diagnosed um, until it is really too late. Um, about 210,000 Americans under the age of 20 are estimated to have diagnosed diabetes. And so that's about 0.25% of the overall uh, juvenile population. And from 2014 to 2015, the annual incidence of diagnosed diabetes was estimated at 18,200 um, and 5,800 with type 2 diabetes. We are really seeing a big increase in kids with type 2. Um, this goes along with our national rates in terms of you know, activity, obesity, um, processed food intake, um, but type 1 rates are also on the rise. Uh, and so we're seeing an, an increase in autoimmune disorders in children in the United States. Um, so that's, all, that's pretty surprising. So that complication, DKA, we're looking there at diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, this is a state where if we don't have enough insulin to provide for our metabolic needs, the body's going to switch over to fat metabolism. The byproduct of that fat metabolism is a ketone, which is a fatty acid. When they become too high a level in the bloodstream, we're going to again see the signs of, of diabetes onset. Um, and this is a ketone action guide uh, to the right. Um, these resources are widely available. Um, and But what's mostly misunderstood is most people think that ketones come from elevated blood sugar because when we see them in adults, we tend to see the two together. When adults have diabetic ketoacidosis, they also have wildly high blood sugar typically because the lack of insulin has allowed their blood sugar to get quite high. In children, we will often see ketone production before we see A1C levels rise. Um, children will show periods of reduced pancreatic function that lead to ketone production and can lead to DKA, but it can happen in brief, uh, very acute bouts, and so it often goes missed. Um, severe DKA leads to cerebral edema, um, and, and uh, that skewing of the blood's pH then leads to multi-organ failure, coma, and death. And unfortunately, um, in the developing world, uh, what is known as diagnosis by DKA is still practiced. Um, if if child is showing symptoms, they really just wait because uh, eventually the child will go into DKA, and that's how we'll know they have diabetes. Um, but in the U.S., rates are still very, very high. Most children are still diagnosed in a state of DKA, um, and that can be reduced and avoided. So how does type 1 diagnosis, and particularly that diagnosis by DKA, impact a child's physiology? Um, well, in, in Europe, about 20% of children have DKA on diagnosis. 
um, but in the United States, it's about 40%. As I mentioned, in the developing world, it's more like 80 to 90%, um, depending on the country. But we can see, you know, obviously, there is a mechanism. There is something happening in Europe that is reducing DKA upon diagnosis rates that isn't happening here in the States. Um, the, the impact of DKA causes uh, subtle learning and emotional problems, uh, such as poor concentration. They have been reported by parents and providers of children who have had an episode of DKA. Um, there are also suggested long-term decreases in memory function. And in school-age children, um, they have had studies uh, that have done uh, brain scans and shown some reduced reduced function not only directly following an episode of DKA um, but for an extended period afterwards. Um, a single episode of moderate to severe DKA um, is associated with lower cognitive scores and altered brain growth due to that clinical that in a severe or acute case of DKA or subclinical in a mild to moderate um, but both can cause levels of cerebral edema. Um, so even if a child is not in severe DKA, even if they're just in a prolonged state of subclinical DKA, where maybe they're showing the, some signs or maybe they're intermittent, maybe their A1C isn't extremely high, maybe their blood sugar isn't extremely high, but they have small to moderate ketones present for an extended period of time, even that subclinical um, presentation can cause cere cerebral edema and have some really long lasting effects. So outside of the clinical setting, you know, what happens when a kid is diagnosed by DKA? Well, obviously we have the disruption in education um, from the short term being they're gonna be out of school for at least a week. Uh, when children are hospitalized for DKA, they're in the ICU for a few days to a week. Um, so we've got a disruption to, to education. And then in the long term, um, we know that just catching up from that, uh, that episode is going to be difficult. But if they then have these ongoing learning complications, uh, there's going to be a real disruption there, um, as well as the burden of having to take on diabetes um, is going to be a stressor that's going to disrupt their educational progress. They're going to have, we're going to see some disordered eating tendencies um, that food is now medicine. Um, and when, when they've been through something as severe as DKA, um, that's going to inflame any changes that are going on. Um, it's going to make families and, and practitioners and children feel a little bit more desperate. And so, uh, again, the kind of trauma response to hyper-restrict is going to be stronger. Um, we've got a financial burden. Um, Obviously, unplanned for diabetes can be crippling. We're looking at a week-long hospital stay for a family that might be underinsured or uninsured. Um, children with diabetes then qualify for state Medicaid for most programs, um, but that doesn't count for that initial hospital stay. Um, we have an increased fear of, of life and death fears. Um, children and parents fearing fearing highs and lows because their initial experience with diabetes was a near-death experience. Um, we have just the trauma of a long hospitalization. Um, you know, to have a new phase of your life begin with a near-death rush to the emergency room, uh, begin with an extended stay in an ICU unit, and then an extended stay in the hospital is, can be really traumatizing. And then being uh, thought of as a sick kid. Diabetes is a disease that we have to live with for the rest of our lives. There is no cure, there is only management. Um, and so for the initial perception for a child to be of that I am very sick and that I'm in a hospital for a long time um, really undercuts the empowerment that is needed to successfully navigate life with type one diabetes. So how can we prevent this? How can we reduce this diagnosis by DKA? Well, we've got some screening options. Um, we have uh, screenings in the lab. Um, we're looking at antibody and genetic screenings. And then we have what I call the boots on the ground screening, screenings that we can be doing in our clinics, offices, home visits, and so forth, uh, which is to screen for ketones. 
Um, genetic screening for type one is uh, for first generate recommended for first generations of persons with type one, but even then, only ten percent of people um, who are diagnosed have relatives who are going to show positive in a genetic screening. Um, so we're seeing that there is definitely a genetic component to the development of type 1 diabetes, but it's definitely not the key or we definitely don't understand it yet. Um, the best thing that we get for these genetic screenings is that we can increase the population per, for prevention and delay studies. They're less useful for letting us as individuals know our diabetes development risk because do I fall in that 10% or not? It's a very, very narrow window. But if I do, then we can increase that population pool for studies. Um, this is a very high cost study, not gonna be covered by insurance um, because it's limited diagnostic value. Um, funding here is gonna be from research grants such as the Juvenile Research, or Diabetes Research Foundation um, and others that are doing active research in this area. Um, antibody screenings, on the other hand, are more effective. Um, each year, about 10% of children with two or more autoantibodies will develop diabetes, and after 15 years, 85% will have diabetes. So um, if we have this first-generation relative with diabetes, or a hint, a symptom, a maybe we might be looking at type 1 diabetes and we do an autobody or anti blah, auto antibody screening um, it's usually called the GAD auto antibody screening um, and we get a positive there for two or more auto antibodies we can say okay we are 10 percent likely to see a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes in the next year but we are 85 percent likely to see it in the next 15, so let's keep an eye on this. Um, identification is shown to reduce rates of DKA from 40 to less than five. Um, there was a, a large uh, study done in a clinic where they just did broadband um, testing of anyone with a first generation uh, relative with type 1 and anyone who, any child who showed a potential symptom of type 1 diabetes, they did autoantibody screenings and they brought their DK risks down to less than 5. Um, it's a much lower cost. It can be combined with other standard blood testing. Um, in that clinic trial, um, they combined it with lead test, uh, which they were doing uh, standard on children between 1 and 2 years of age. Um, uh, it can be combined with celiac because type 1 and celiac often go together. And then for it can be combined with um, cholesterol and other screenings. Antibody screenings are typically covered by insurance, so the cost to the, the patient is going to be much lower. But then we have ketone screening. Um, obviously, antibody screening, we're going to have to have uh, a doctor involved in writing that script. Ketone screening we don't actually have to have a script written to do it because it's a, a completely non-invasive, um, it's not only a diagnostic test, but it is a risk test. Um, so just like we don't have to have orders to check oxygen levels or heart rates, uh, other vital signs, input, output, um, we don't have to have an order to check for ketones. Um, and 40% of diabetes diagnosis under 18 is in DKA, so they have high levels of ketones. Um, risks there, again, death, organ failure. Um, once someone has had an episode of DKA, their risk for DKA in the future is higher. Uh, higher long-term complication risks, again, the trauma. Um, and to compare and contrast to uh, with antibody screenings or genetic screenings, high cost, we need a prescription, we have to get blood drawn, we have to go to the lab. Here we have a single urine dipstick costs roughly 15 cents. Um, and so we could test every kid who came in with the flu and still be cheaper than a single genetic screening for one child. Um, I would recommend everyone checking out this website. It's called previouslyhealthy.org. And it is the story of those 280 children in the US who die due to DKA. 
Um, this little girl spent over 30 days at Chapel Hill Children's Hospital. And every single day of her stay there, her record read previously healthy. She died of DKA. She could have been saved with a 15 cent test that was never done. So um, her family has started a campaign. There are a number of campaigns in in the US right now to really push for clinicians to be doing D or to be doing ketone testing regularly when symptoms of type 1 present. Uh, literature reveals that a simple estimation of blood glucose by cap capillary method using finger prick has been used very rarely in physician consultation rooms. It's a simple investigation that could have led to diagnosis and had their diagnosis missed prior to DKA. Um, so again, we can be doing finger stick blood sugars in office. We can be doing ketone tests in office. They're cheap, easy ways to save lives and save a lot of trauma um, and a lot of loss um, that goes into early diagnosis. So what are those symptoms? Who are the kids that we're going to be ketone testing or, or finger sticking to check for uh, signs of early onset diabetes? Um, we've got uh, the, the classic uh, polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia. So lots of urination, lots of drinking, and lots of eating. Um, the problem is these are often mistaken for other things. So if you have a child in front of you presenting with bedwetting, um, they were having a great time potty training, and now all of a sudden they're bedwetting. Or a child who's a little older who is suddenly bedwetting, um, we often you know, overlook that and we think, well, there's some sort of emotional trauma going on or a change that they're not adjusting well to or even a growth spurt. Um, or a child that's having a lot of trouble potty training. We think, well, they're just not ready yet or maybe mom and dad aren't going about it the right way. Um, frequent UTIs. Um, we think, oh, it's the bubble bath. It's poor bathroom hygiene. Um, it's that a boy's not circumcised when actually we could be overlooking uh, type 1 diabetes. Um, again, a simple ketone test can tell you. Um, polyphagia, so lots of eating, and it's very easy to, uh, to uh, write this off as a growth spurt. I know my little guy, uh, when he's growing, he will clean us out of house and home. I shudder to think what he'll do in his teens, but um, especially if that combines with another symptom, Think type 1 diabetes, go for one of those cheap, easy tests. Uh, polydipsia, lots of drinking. Uh, we tend to often uh, attribute this to like attachment, um, children that like their cup or their bottle for comfort. And so they're just drinking a lot because it's comforting for them. Um, or a strep throat that they're wanting to drink to uh, keep things uh, comfortable in their throat. Weight loss is a huge red flag. Weight loss or failure to thrive in children is a major sign of type 1 diabetes. Um, the children just should not be losing weight. Um, and in type 1 diabetes, that fat metabolism, uh, they're eating, but they're just not able to retain and use those calories that they're eating. So those calories go out through urination and then they're burning their body's fat stores. So weight loss can often be quite rapid. However, you can also have a child, um, especially when it's a slower onset of type 1 diabetes, who can show other signs with no weight loss whatsoever. Um, vision changes and, and headaches in children often is attributed to nearsightedness and they're sent off to the eye doctor um, when it's actually a change in osmotic pressure. Um, in and around the eye that is uh, caused by uh, elevated blood glucose levels. Late signs are often mistaken for um, late signs and near DKA um, is nausea and vomiting. Uh, GI illness is the most common. Uh, we see parents take their kids to the ED, nausea, vomiting and the parent is saying there's something really wrong with my kid, this is not normal. It's flu season, they're told it's food poisoning, it's norovirus, it's the flu. Take them home and have them drink a lot of fluid and they're, they're already drinking a lot of fluid because they have type 1 diabetes. Um, lethargy, again, if they look like they have the flu, 
lethargy is going to play into that. Um, and fruity acetone or foul smelling breath um, is very often missed. Um, this is um, often written out as, as dental neglect or, or again, strep throat. Um, a child may have strep throat. They may also have type 1 diabetes. Um, they may have a GI illness. They may also have type 1 diabetes. They happen at the same time. Um, very often that severe case of, of something like strep or a viral GI infection is actually what's going to push their body into a level of stress that actually causes the full-blown diabetes um, to fully present um, and for their ketone levels to get to such a level that they're now in DKA. Um, they might have been in early stages again. They might have had small to medium ketones before that, but now the sickness inflames things to where their body can no longer compensate and can't keep up, and so they end up in DKA. Um, heavy breathing, um, particularly if it's a sort of pursed lip uh, breathing in, in nursing, we often see this um, in uh, COPD patients, we call it blowing in COPD, where they're trying to blow off um, the acid. They're trying, it's their body trying to maintain pH levels. And we see this in um, late stages of DKA. So again, a reminder that DKA does not, or diabetes does not have a color. Twice as many children of color die from diabetes complications than Caucasian children. Um, this is a place where the diabetes community is really working um, because our, for too long, our advertising and, and our imaging for um, diabetes has been thin white children uh, when the actuality is that a person with diabetes just looks like the average person. They might be obese. Uh, they're gonna be of any color, any gender. So that's type one, how about type two? These kids that are showing up more and more often with type two diabetes um, and what's also called MODI, another form of insulin resistant diabetes. How can we decipher if we're looking at type one or type two? Are we looking at type two or MODI? Um, in type two and MODI, we're looking at insulin resistance. And so again, the insulin acts as those keys that open the door to the cell and let glucose in. Um, in type two diabetes, it's like the door to the, the, uh, the lock to the door gets a bit gummed up, usually by other hormones. Fat, um, intervisceral fat actually produces hormones that will actually almost fit the insulin receptors on cells. And so it's very easy for it to sort of block the um, insulin um, uptake and, and function. Um, and so the body's going to produce, have to produce more and more and more insulin to achieve the same thing. And if it's not able to do that, we're gonna see blood sugar levels rise. Um, because we have so much insulin production, now DKA is very, very, very rare in uh, type 2 or MODI diabetes. In fact, we have just an overabundance of insulin. So in, in pediatric type 2, uh, what are we going to look for to give us hints? Well, we're going to look for family risk factors. Um, this one can be tricky. Um, because family risk factors like type 2 diabetes also tend to come along with family habits, uh, family lifestyle factors that get passed down generationally, like uh, poor eating habits, sedentary lifestyle, um, higher weight. Um, but uh, there is a strong genetic component to type 2 diabetes. So in the family history, aunts, uncles, grandparents, was there any type 2? Um, metabolic syndrome. Um, this can. This is when we get a increased level of that intravis. Um, sorry, intravisceral fat in the uh, thoracic. Uh, so we're looking at. Um, is, does the child have a, a round belly? What is their waist to hip ratio, just like in an adult? Um, if if we have a high waist to hip ratio that indicates this metabolic syndrome. With metabolic syndrome, we also tend to get elevated triglycerides. Um, and so running a lipid panel, even on a child, is gonna give you a lot of information on that metabolic syndrome status. Um, they're going to be autoantibody negative, typically. 
um, we do see, um, you know, we can have a child who would have gotten diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when they were 25, but they're struggling with obesity in childhood. And so they also have insulin resistance before they even get to the type one. So the type, the two can um, occur together. We see it very common in adults. Um, elevated C-peptide. C-peptide is the byproduct of endogenous insulin use by the body. Um, so in someone with type two diabetes, their body's going to be making more and more and more of that insulin. So we're gonna see those elevated C-peptide levels in blood tests. Um, how do we treat um, pediatric type, type, type two diabetes? Primarily through lifestyle. Lifestyle approaches need to definitely be a family approach. Again, those lifestyle issues are never um, in isolation in that one child, their, their learned patterns that have been passed down. Um, and then metformin is also being used more and more in the, the uh, pediatric population. We wanna monitor for la lactic acidosis is our primary concern in the pediatric population with metformin use. Uh, so that's type two. We then have maturity onset diabetes of the young, MODI. Wow, that sounds a lot like type two, right? <laughs> um, but what we have in Modi that makes it stand out is actually a genetic mutation. So there's a change in the genetic marking um, that causes insulin resistance. It actually changes the insulin receptors um, structurally so that now we need that increased C or insulin production in order to overcome that issue. Um, these, again, we're gonna see um, intense insulin resistance here. Uh, we're gonna see elevated C-peptide levels. And the treatment here is actually typically sulfonylureas are gonna be really effective. We often see children with Modi um, be diagnosed as type one because that intensity of insulin resistance, blood sugars go quite high. And when we give them exogenous insulin, when we give them injected insulin, blood sugars come down, but those insulin needs are often quite high. Um, and so their risk for hypoglycemia is very high and they'll have a lot of trouble trying to manage with diabetes um, when just a sulfonylurea uh, can help their body produce sufficient insulin because they haven't lost their ability to make the insulin. They just need more um, assistance doing that. So uh, long-term use for sulfonylureas and Modi can typically be managed quite well. Full family approach is always needed. And this is gonna be with any diabetes diagnosis. Um, dietary adjustments will need to be full family. Um, everybody needs to learn about carbohydrates. Everybody needs to learn about carb counting and everybody needs to watch their portion sizing. A child will feel punished for having diabetes if they're the only one on a special diet. Um, diets are a really unhealthy way of thinking to start a child out with food. Um, we wanna discuss and allow, uh, discuss strategies to allow a kid to be a kid while still managing blood sugars. You know, um, nothing will crush a child's um, desire to manage their own wellness and, and to be healthy, like standing out in the crowd, being the only kid who can't have a cupcake at a birthday party, being the only kid who can't go you know, who, who can't go have some eggnog or something, you know, at a family event, they're very quickly going to want to avoid those events to, to avoid the feeling of isolation and shame. Um, and that's going to lead to a lot of unhealthy psychosocial issues. Um, there's no reason for any child with, the, with diabetes of any kind to avoid sports or physical activity simply because of diabetes. It can absolutely be managed. Um, stresses on parents are incredibly high. Um, and if their treatment goals differ, it can be a major problem and a major stressor. Um, we see families whose, um, uh, whose marriage just blows apart. They may have had some underlying things going on, but the stress of a diabetes diagnosis and all of the changes that are gonna have to come with that, um, especially if 
one parent feels like, eh, let a kid be a kid, and as long as their blood sugar is not 300, it's fine, and the other parent feels like, absolutely not, we have to manage everything and get their A1C under six, you know, those two are going to hit, and it's going to be explosive, explosive, and we've got a child in the middle trying to learn about what does it look like for me to live my life with diabetes, and this is the, the level of stress and conflict they're seeing. Um, so addressing, again, the whole family, um, addressing and, and being very open and honest to ask about, you know, are there marriage stressors? Um, are there finance stressors? Again, the financial burden of type 1 diabetes cannot be underestimated, and that financial stress is going to be a huge ticking time bomb um, for relationships. Um, and then stress is also high on siblings. Um, they may feel the need to take on parental roles, particularly if parents are struggling in diabetes management, but even if they're not, um, and parents often unwittingly pass this on to their kids, you know, go, oh, your brother's having a low blood sugar, make sure he goes and get ju gets, go get him some juice, make sure he eats something. You've basically just told a sibling to make sure there's their, their little brother or sister doesn't die. That is an insane amount of pressure to put on the child. Um, and so working with the family to avoid that kind of children taking on parental roles, but they also may feel left out. Um, you know, and no matter what they do uh, to to be the good kid or the bad kid, we might see some behavioral problems start to creep up in siblings because they're feeling left out. They're not getting the hours of attention that their brother or sister might be getting now that diabetes is part of their world. Um, so making sure that the family is allowing for them to have some outlets, some additional supports. Um, and education for them on what diabetes and living with diabetes means as well. So challenges of early diagnosis and how can you help? This uh, is the picture of probably an hour in the life of a parent or a child with a diagnosis of diabetes. It's bouncing from, from one struggle to the next a lot. Our first six months were really in survival mode. So we've we've done our job. We made sure that kid who looked like they had the stomach flu got a ketone test. And now we've got them successfully diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And we saved them a lot of trauma from being in the hospital. What are we working with now? First six months, survival. Just trying to keep up. Uh, we're looking at the stages of grief. Um, we're looking at depression. Uh, denial, anger, bargaining, and acceptance. Um, we teaching families about that. This is a chronic, lifelong disease. Your your view of how this week was going to go has has now died. There's a sense of loss there. Your your idea of what your child's childhood was going to look like is just not the same. Um, for kids, what they thought this baseball season was going to look like, it's not going to be the same. And so there's some grieving to be done there. There are some things to work through and it's not linear. Um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes 15 years ago and there are still days when I hit each of those stages of grief. I spent a lot more time in acceptance than I used to, thankfully. Um, honeymooning. Unfortunately, the pancreas and uh, insulin production doesn't just stop. It's not an on-off switch unless someone has a pancreatectomy. Um, it's, it's going to be quite a process. Um, and, so, and it can take months and it is terrible. Um, as clinicians, we want to say yay because we know that an extended honeymoon period, the longer we're making our own endogenous insulin, the lower our complication risk, the lower our DKA risk, the lower our severe hypoglycemia risk, but trying to manage blood sugars while the pancreas randomly turns on and off is maddening. So letting parents know what, and letting, letting children know, letting everyone, letting the whole family know, um, the prognosis that this is honeymooning and that it's going to take a while and that this is what it's going to look like, um, empowering the family to make adjustments, you know, increase your basal, reduce your basal, giving those them, them those, uh, that education on how to do that, how to ebb and flow with pancreatic function, um, getting CGM stat. Fortunately, now most kids are, who are diagnosed, like, 
leave the hospital on CGM. But it, especially if we're getting that early diagnosis that's not going to come with a week-long hospital stay, getting them on CGM ASAP is really, really helpful. And, and pump therapy is re also really helpful in honeymooning. Um, it allows us to sort of ebb and flow with those insulin needs a little more easily in a much more timely way. Um, another a big struggle is tiny doses. The smaller the patient, the smaller the doses. Um, in a small child, uh, my youngest patient to date was eight months old. Uh, one unit of insulin will lower the blood sugar of an eight month old about 300 points. Um, so diluting insulin is an absolute must for small children. Um, if if the ability to bolus to correct blood sugar is being inhibited, diluting insulin is going to open that up. Um, diluting insulin is not FDA approved in pump therapy, um, but um, it just opens up a lot of therapy options that would otherwise have been um, have have been out of reach. Um, Inaccuracies are magnified with kids because they are so insulin sensitive. Um, insulin pens are very inaccurate under two unit doses. Small children may only be on two units of insulin a day. So um, before using an insulin pen with a small child, you might wanna consider using syringes. Um, where the parent's going to be able to eyeball a half a unit, a quarter unit, or one unit more precisely than that pen would. Um, also, insulin pumps um, are not terribly accurate in basal delivery. Um, the Omnipod is actually, we recommend not using an Omnipod on a child under a basal dose of 0.7 units per hour. Um, because it's it's just not going to be accurate enough to deliver that zero point or I'm sorry zero point yeah zero point seven units that zero point zero five dose um, from an Omnipod is really um, just not accurate enough for small children it can cause some really wild slides in blood sugar um, the tandem pump um, is a good deal more accurate at small doses and then the Medtronic pumps um, offer the smallest basal dose but the accuracy down there is about the same as the tandem. So what can we do? Um, we can teach, we can help families develop um, a healthy balance between fear, like to not fear insulin, but to respect it. Um, remember what we don't know will hurt us and will make us fearful. So educate, educate, educate teaching them um, how to calculate doses with carb ratios and uh, correction factors versus flat meal dosing and sliding scales that are very mysterious and leave a lot of room for error. Um, also teaching uh, the new math, how to calculate insulin on board, um, and then really educating patients on how to treat hypoglycemia. Um, patient, parents are terrified that their kids are going to go low. So again, getting them a CGM and teaching them how to effectively treat hypoglycemia, really, really key to uh, reducing fear. And then there are so many tasks. The number of times we tag in with diabetes per day ranges into the hundreds. So bundling tasks, um, you know, blood sugar testing and, and mealtime testing, um, physical activity, how to bundle them all, um, how to get proactive, how to look ahead at, okay, what's gonna come this afternoon? Do we have swim lessons? Do we have dance class this afternoon? Okay, then we've got a snack here and we've got an insulin dose there. How can we bundle all this in so I can make one good decision for the afternoon instead of trying to make five decisions and then just fix it later, which can be, really get exhausting. Um, we're always going to be at our best when we're proactive instead of reactive. Um, so that's uh, what I have to share with you today. Again, my name is Alicia Downs. I'm the Director of Patient Care and Education at Integrated Diabetes Services. Um, at IDS, um, we work with patients um, with all forms of diabetes, but we specialize in intensive insulin management. Um, so we work with a lot of families and persons with uh, type 1 diabetes. 
um, as well as what's uh, LADA, adult diagnosed type 1 diabetes, or like type 1 and a half, um, type 2 patients who are um, on intensive insulin therapy. Um, and we work remotely. Um, so uh, this format is no new thing to us. Uh, we work with patients across the country and around the world um, on all kinds of insulin, all kinds of uh, technologies. Uh, we help them use their insulin most effectively and, and live life on their terms with diabetes. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me today. And um, thank you, Alicia. That was that was really terrific. Um, we do have some time for questions and we have a couple questions already in the question box. Um, just wanna let those know who have joined us for the webinar that the question box is still open. So please feel free to um, add any questions you might have. So here's one um, asking you if you could please talk more about CGM um the listener has a 16 year old client recently diagnosed and he's testing four times a day with finger stick mm -hmm. um cgm or continuous glucose monitoring is a worn device um that then transmits uh so back up worn device it inserts a small filament uh about the size about the thickness and and texture of a piece of fishing line um, inserts it under the skin, and it's worn for anywhere from 10 to 14 days, depending on the uh, the maker. And it then relays from that sensor through some form of transmitter to a receiver. Um, nowadays, most people's receivers are on their cell phone. Um, so for a teenager, it doesn't require them to carry any extra stuff. And every five minutes, it's going to check that interstitial glucose level run that through an algorithm to kind of translate it to what would be a blood sugar number and sends it to that receiver. Um, some of them, uh, we've got the Freestyle Libre where they would hold the phone and scan it over the device to get their blood sugar as well as a trend. So clinically speaking, it's really useful because we see 24 hours every five minutes what is happening with blood sugar. So it lets us see a lot in between. Um, for young people, the biggest highlight is uh, called either the Medtronic uh, Guardian 3 CGM or the Dexcom G6 has a real-time alert system. So we can program so that if a blood sugar goes below, say, 80, we're going to get an audible or a vibration alert to let us know that that's happening. Or if blood sugar goes above 250, we're going to get that alert to let us know what happens. Um, so it really helps with management on the top end. It really helps with safety on the bottom end. And then they also all then work with a companion app that can also let care providers know what's going on with blood sugar. So they're really great um, when parents feel like, I have to be with little Johnny at all times in case he has a low. Mm. Well, mom, now you can ease up and you can let little Johnny go be a kid because you're going to get an alert when he goes below 80. And now you can text little Johnny and say, make sure you drink some juice and and feel a lot better and a lot safer. So uh, they're pretty much gold standard um, for pediatrics now. A uh, kid has diabetes. They get a CGM. Insurance is really good about it. Medicaid covers it for kids. Um, the tough thing with teenagers, the tough cell can be wearability. I'm gonna wear a thing on my body that kind of announces to the world that I have diabetes. So that can be a tough piece for teens where their, their body autonomy and their peer perception is kind of their central world. Um, but they're really small now. Um, I wear one 24 hours a day and I'd have to do the Macarena to tell you where it is on my body right now. I can't even feel it. Um, <laughs> um, they're currently, they're all um, about the thickness of if you tap stacked about three quarters on top of one another, two to three quarters. Um, and they're about yay big. Um, so I would say go online. You can find, you can find info on them really easy. Um, Dexcom.com, freestylelibre.com or Medtronic.com. Thank you for that very extensive answer. Um, speaking of, of teens, can you talk a little bit, is there any impact of puberty on diabetes or vice versa? Um, there's no sort of causal piece. So we don't see like an increase in diagnosis around puberty or anything like that. 
Um, what we do see is that in kids that already have diabetes, puberty is a minefield. Um, those hormone shifts, uh, we have the hormone shifts and we have a lot of rapid growth. Um, we actually see in small children, when kids are having growth spurts, insulin needs will jump just astronomically. It's, it's hard to keep our brains around sometimes how much like, oh, my tiny baby who used to, you know, take two units of insulin on a day now needs seven units of insulin at breakfast in a very short amount of time. Then we level out at kind of eight to kind of 12, 13 age. We don't do a whole lot of growing. So blood sugar needs also move more slowly. And then we hit adolescence and puberty hits. And again, we start seeing these rapid jumps in blood sugar needs. Um, and then girls have the added piece that uh, menarche. Um, for months before menarche, uh, we have these hormone cycles that are beginning. And as estrogen levels climb, insulin resistance increases. And then, you know, progestin levels, things drop on the other side of the cycle. And now insulin needs decrease. And riding that can be difficult on top of, you know, little Sally grew two inches this year and her insulin needs have gone way up. And she's worried because, she doesn't want to take more insulin because she heard somewhere online that taking insulin will make her gain weight. That gets really, really tough. Um, combined with just the management of the teen years, it's really, really important for younger children to take on their own management and be able to um, take on a sense of ownership of their diabetes um, from ages kind of 12 to 14, if they were diagnosed before that, it's kind of a critical time for kids to, to take ownership of that because then their teens come along and diabetes is just part of who they are mm -hmm. and they manage along with it. If they don't have that, if either the parents keep a lot of their management control because parents want to let their kid be a kid and not make them have to do this very grown up thing, um, or if if kids are, uh, you know, their management is really, really tight and really, really super restrictive. And then all of a sudden it is handed to them at 14. Mm. You know, we kind of know what happens with really super restricted kids who are then turned free on the world. And it happens with their diabetes management too. So building that sense of self, building those uh, management skills, building relationships with their clinicians um, as early as possible. When teens are diagnosed, it's really hard because it really rocks their sense of who they are. Mm. Um, so again, really making sure that that mom and dad take the passenger seat, that when you're talking to a kid who's 15, 16 years old and they're being diagnosed, that you really are talking to them, that you're really educating and coaching them and that mom and dad are along for the ride because this really is something that they are going to have to take the lead on in their life is really, really key. And then setting good, healthy uh, goals. You know, the teen years, it's like damage control. <laughs> let's, let's have diabetes management be attainable and something that I can do and still live my life. Not the time to try to push for that like 6.0 A1C and try to get things with it. Let them be a kid. Let them have the autonomy to then make their own decision about just how good their control could, should be. I always tell parents it's a lot like driving the car. You don't ride them the entire time and scream at them every time they don't parallel park right. Like you got to give them the autonomy to, to get their own speeding ticket. You know, as long as they're not driving drunk and, and running over pedestrians, they'll get there. They'll learn. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having horrible nightmares. My son is three going on 13. So it's coming. <laughs> um, what, are, uh, what are some good resources to help kids or newly diagnosed families with diabetes? Great question. And this was a, like, as I was reading, I was like, oh, I should have put this in here. Um, <laughs> JDRF is amazing. Um, JDRF, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, has really become the type one diabetes research foundation. It's, it's for adults and kids now, but they have an amazing program called Diabetes Ambassadors. And what they do mm -hmm. is when someone is diagnosed, if someone alerts the JDRF, they'll reach out to their local families and families who have 
been there, done that, who have tread that path, they'll be, they'll be partnered. So they'll get a kit and for littles, it includes a teddy bear that has um, patches where the kid can actually practice their injections and their finger sticks on the bear. Um, it'll have a ton of information um, and as, as well as their connection information for their local JDRF chapter, but they'll also get the phone number and email address of a family who's been there so that they can reach out. And I've just seen amazing, amazing um, outcomes from that. Um, I also really recommend um, for kids and teens, there is the um, Children with Diabetes, CWD, does amazing camps and clinics for, for parents and kids. They're absolutely amazing. Um, there's the College Diabetes Network for teens and young adults that is amazing. Um, on social media, I love um, Beyond Type 1 is a diabetes advocacy, empowerment, and education social network. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the founders is Nick Jonas. Uh, and <laughs> Not as young as he used to be, but um, so he's got a little cred with the young people. But no, it's it's actually designed for young people. So it's not like your grandma's diabetes website that's about like mm -hmm. checking your feet and getting AARP discounts, right? It's it's real life, real world boots on the ground education and support. Those sound like uh, wonderful resources. I know that on our Tuesday webinar, we learned about um, a camp that's more local to New Jersey called Camp Najida yeah. um, for children with diabetes. And now I know how to pronounce it too. So I didn't know how to pronounce it on Tuesday. Yeah, we, um, work, with, we work with Camp Najida as well because we're not too far, we're right here in Philly. So. Oh, that's right, okay. Um, what's the best diet for kids with diabetes? Is the keto diet safe for them? Um, the best diet for kids with diabetes is the same diet for every other kid on planet Earth. Right. We all know a healthy, well-balanced diet, eat your rainbow, lean fats and proteins um, is ideal. Uh, the keto diet is actually not recommended for children. It's really, really difficult to get a full nutrient balance on the keto diet. If a family is not going to be really keen on eating some really out there stuff and doing a lot of cooking and meal prep. If you tell the average family eat keto, you're now looking at a kid who's gonna live on cheese sticks and Slim Jims, and that's gonna be deadly. Um, we see a lot of v or a v vitamin, B vitamin um, deficit in the keto diet in all populations, but in kids, um, that, that deficit of B vitamins and folates can be really damaging um, for, uh, we're, uh, learning. Um, so we see a, a bit of learning deficit in kids that are on really strict uh, low carb and, and keto diets um, and also growth. Um, there's some growth retardation that happens um, with, with really low carb dieting. So carb conscious, carb controlled um, is considered, you know, down to 100 or carbs a day is considered carb controlled. Under 60 is considered low carb. So we always tell parents definitely shoot for 60 or more and then make sure those carbs are really high quality. Make sure they're high grain or whole grains. Make sure they're natural grains. Um, you know, make sure that those 60 grams aren't Fruit Loops. Um, but but really, and then just like everybody else, everybody on planet Earth should probably be on the same diet. Right. Plan. Sounds like a, a healthy diet, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Moderation is where it is. And again, um, if you raise a kid. Um, to think carbs are terrible, you're going to end up with one of two things when they go off on their own. A kid who just doesn't eat anything and is really unhealthy and has a really unhealthy, um, uh, you know, disordered eating. Uh, disordered eating is about 10 times more common in kids with type 1 than the mm -hmm. average population, than the general population, because it is kind of by nature disordered eating when we have to kind of count our carbs and things like that. Um, but it can go dangerous really, really quickly. Um, or you're going to get a kid who like lives off Mountain Dew and Twinkies because he wasn't allowed to have them as a kid. So, <laughs> no, I could see that. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, is a doctor order a doctor's order needed for ketone testing? It's not. You don't have to have a doctor's order to perform a ketone test. 
um, because it is just a urine dipstick. Um, and you don't actually need a doctor's order for a glucose test if you know if you have reason to suspect that someone is in a state of severe hyper or hypoglycemia you can test that as a nurse um as an rn um in pennsylvania maryland and delaware i know <laughs> i know for a fact everywhere <laughs> i've been licensed um well in maryland and delaware are compact states so there you go there's most of the country um but uh yeah you don't have to have a doctor's order for the the ketone test you would need a doctor's order if you were then going to bill for it you would have to have a script a doctor's order at that point great well thank you so much alicia i really appreciate um this presentation i know i learned a lot um about uh diabetes in children and i hope that our listeners did as well. Um, I just want to thank you, of course, all of our listeners who've joined us today, as well as Laura Hall, who's been handling the back end of our program. A reminder that in an hour, you will receive an email with a link to the post-program evaluation. Once you've filled out that evaluation, you'll receive your certificate of completion within the body of an email within one week. A calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found at www.partnershipmch.org under the Professional Education tab. We also encourage you to check out our on-demand recordings of many of our programs, which are listed there as well. Thank you, and I hope you can join us at one of our upcoming educational events.